Hi everyone, welcome to episode two of the In The Hub podcast with me, Neil Facker. Today we'll be speaking to Peter Bruce about the future of trade events and conferences within the broadcast industry. Peter now offers his expert advice and guidance as a consultant to the media and broadcast industry within the Asia and Pacific region. Peter's career spans 30 plus years working with companies like Ampex, Thompson and Grass Valley and IABM. So Peter, how are you today? I, I'm very good, Neil, and uh, thanks for giving me the opportunity to be here. So we'll get straight into the questions, if that's all right with you, Peter. Sure. Awesome. So, Peter, you've clearly had quite an extensive career within broadcast industry. So what experience of trade shows have you had before? For me, the beginning or the first uh, broadcast trade show that I went to was uh, IBC as a student uh, when it was still based in the, the UK before it moved uh, abroad. And I've basically been to every IBC since. Uh, not so many NABs, probably about half of the NAB since in the last 30 years. Uh, from um, uh, my side, obviously, I'm just off the back of uh, my tenure at the IABM, where I've been working with uh, the broadcasts and uh, media uh, exhibitions across Asia, of which I've been doing one show or conference, including the IBM conference in London, uh, as well as the the IBC, NAB, and the regional shows across Asia. So uh, I was doing more 12 plus shows per year uh, in the last five years. And uh, I've uh, had experience from field service of setting up, uh, having the marketing budget to, to run shows, uh, and then also, of course, representing uh, the broadcast industry with the exhibitors and working with many exhibitors and conference sessions, uh, which have also been running conference sessions as well. So, uh, uh, yeah, so quite quite a uh, important part of my, uh, let's say, working career. Yeah. So could you summarize how events and conferences have, have shaped the broadcast industry today? Yeah, I mean, the, the broadcast and uh, media industry and the exhibitions, if, if we talk about the exhibitions, because there's uh, always two sides to, uh, you know, the conferences and exhibitions, which uh, a lot of the uh, supplying companies who are booking the booths uh, often never get to the actual conference itself. And that's also part of a key part of many of the exhibitions. Uh, but obviously, uh, the exhibitions have changed and they have adapted over the years where uh, when we look at the uh, original exhibitions we used to go with huge CRTs we used to have huge several days build of hardware and obviously what is happening to the industry is that it's moved uh, moved more and more as software solutions where the setup is maybe just booting a laptop and putting it to a PC screen so uh, this is also as the industry has changed and it's changing towards more uh, software solutions, IT and telco centric, uh, how the exhibitions has been uh, adapted uh, and has been ad uh, adjusted within the broadcast uh, uh, kind of side of things. So what do events and trade shows mean to you? Are there any particular highlights or years or... Well, I, you know, I, I think when we look at exhibitions, I, I always split it into two, uh, two kind of types. There's, uh, if you like, the highlights. And when, uh, you know, say when you're a junior person in a company, uh, going to IBC and NAB is, is a kind of almost like a badge of honor, honor of course. And uh, when you've been doing it for so many years, you realize what a stress it is uh, to, to, to actually go to the exhibition and uh, be part of the exhibitions. But I, I would separate NAB, IBC as really uh, the huge exhibitions uh, versus local exhibitions, which also have their place. Uh, as I say, I was doing about uh, nine or 10 just across Asia of local exhibitions uh, like BIR TV, uh, Broadcast Asia, uh, uh, Broadcast India, uh, and different exhibitions like that. And you can uh, kind of address them separately, uh, you know, in, in a kind of, knowing I was going to have a lot of sore feet, uh, I knew IBC was, was kind of, uh, you, every year you feel excitement to go, but you know you're going to be darn exhausted uh, after the exhibition. 
Yep. So, I mean, with all of that in mind, do you think that trade shows and events will simply go back to the way they were in, in terms of size and popularity? Uh, no, <laughs> uh, absolutely not. And uh, yeah, I'm, I'm uh, obviously a big, big supporter of exhibitions. And I know uh, you can't, uh, let's say, replicate. And I know we're going to talk about uh, virtual events, but, uh, you know, uh, especially in terms of being uh, from the supply side, uh, being in contact with, um, you know, the, the end users and seeing them face to face. Is, is really a special uh, uh, thing. And obviously what it does mean, and even as I, I mentioned, uh, like Broadcast Asia uh, or uh, Broadcast India, uh, you can meet so many people at those, even those local shows. And if you, it's a very efficient way of meeting people. Uh, whereas if you had to go and try and visit a country uh, within, a, you know, take two or three weeks to go and visit all of those exhibitors who, who come to you. So it's certainly a very efficient way of working. However, as we know that things are going to change dramatically, what I would uh, uh, kind of predict, and it's very difficult to make predictions in time of COVID while we're kind of mid-COVID, uh, and it all depends on when uh, the travel restrictions go down and confidence of people traveling. But uh, certainly next year, NAB uh, is going to be, if it goes ahead, it will probably be more of an American show and a, an awful lot less travelers. I predict both NAB and IBC, again, if they went ahead, you, you're looking in terms of uh, the customer coming, first of all, that's a critical side of, let's say, perhaps less uh, than 30% less, uh, exhibitor space and what we can see, and we'll talk about other ways of doing marketing, uh, probably the exhibitor space may be as low as half uh, book space. So I know you were talking about kind of in-person and uh, face-to-face interactions for closing deals. So, so just how important do you think that these in-person interactions are for creating and closing deals in our industry? Well, they, they, they are important, but they, you also have to realize how, uh, from when I first did my first exhibition, uh, the world has changed to where we are now. And uh, already how people approach exhibitions have varied considerably because as I say, if we rewind 20 years ago, there were literally launches at the show and uh, maybe chief engineers went with budgets and they would buy at the show. Uh, what happens now is that the people going to the exhibitions, one that they have reduced because of the TV stations have less uh, budget to visit shows, uh, they reduce the days, so it's very tight for them to visit shows. So they, they've got to plan very carefully where they're going. The other thing is that online uh, beforehand, the marketing kicks in two to three months before to the main exhibitions like uh, uh, IBC or uh, uh, NAB. So the launch of equipment, people are pretty savvy too. Of course, uh, many exhibitors do put blocks uh, of announcements of products, but they're already out there. So people very closely know if they've got a project on what they're looking into. They're not going there to find out something totally new. What they're trying to do is reinforce and maybe have uh, presentations uh, exactly of uh, what they want to know. Uh, the other reason why things have changed a lot, as I mentioned before, is, is far less hardware centric. So a lot of the software, uh, uh, let's say presentations, can be done remotely. So before they go to the exhibition, they've done a lot of legwork uh, effectively on the PC to review what they're doing, and they've got a very tight schedule. So, so it has changed, and even the exhibition space where you'd build a whole machine room, as I say, when I was with Ampex, we, we used to send a crew for two weeks to do pre-builds and then move into the exhibition beforehand. And we had full machine room and build a whole TV station. Now a lot of that software-centric can be simulated on a PC or cloud. 
so so the the world of exhibitions has changed i think people still would like to go to conferences and they do want to learn and as i say there's always two sides of the uh you know the exhibitions and events because the conference side always has uh, uh, a a kind of uh, need for the end users and what we see anyway are the let's say what i say is the new entries to the broadcast and media the it centric companies or the the telco type companies they would rather not build a big castle and exhibit and they would rather be have influence within the main conference sessions itself so so this whole thing is changing anyway and uh, even how people approach and i think in in the future where many chief engineers have woken up at the beginning of the year, said, right, where's my ticket to NAB or IBC? And they've got it on the calendar. Uh, they're going to review and say, well, do I really need to go? And all of the companies will be looking into how many people do actually need to go and not because they've been the chief engineer for 20 years that they, they're, they're an automatic shoe in. So I think people will, will still be going. Uh, you know, to, especially to NAB at IVC, but I think it'll be reduced. Yeah, so I mean, as a result of, of these recent events, do you think that face-to-face -face interactions will become less important when closing deals in our industry? Well, I think they're always going to be important, but, and uh, you know, it, it is so, and this is why I still believe exhibitions are still valid, uh, validation of exhibitions. Uh, what I have seen, though, and what uh, happens too often in the broadcast and media industry Often, because there's no cost, and this is different, say, than Telco, for example, uh, that, uh, let's say, the TV station or the customer will, will phone up one of the main suppliers and say, hey, we've, we want to do a POC. And because it's at their cost to do the testing and do the, the POC on site, there will be a group of people flying in with equipment and hardware. And then the next week, there may be another manufacturer. Uh, what may change and I've already seen requests obviously in time of COVID where they say look we're going to move forward we're going to buy equipment but what we're going to do is have uh, proof of concept uh, presentations and demonstrations online and don't come to our facility so there will it will be less probably uh, but at the same time you know I still believe that uh, business is done Maybe not a handshake, maybe it's a Japanese bow or uh, an elbow punch, but uh, uh, there, there will be people who want to meet up and, uh, you know, okay, as we've got very uh, fast into using the likes of Team Up and Zoom and uh, the different types of communication medium, uh, you know, it is, uh, let's say, uh, video conferencing can be quite exhausting. And where you can sit through a conference in a whole day or a classroom, uh, you know, it's very timing to do that on a video conference uh, on, on a screen for a whole day. And I'm sure people are looking into why, why you can't keep your attention, you get tired easier. Uh, and, you know, what, what I've also been rolling out and been very successful within the IBM uh, is uh, uh, the member sessions and also trying to get end customers to, you know, uh, relax, have a beer. Often, for example, at Interby in Japan, we do it the day before. Uh, and that's how we've got a lot of uh, supply manufacturers together talking to each other. And, and that kind of interaction, that would not happen uh, if, if it was pure remote. I have done virtual happy hours where we've all had a beer remotely, but, it, but it's not, still not the same thing. Yeah. So in your kind of experience, how have you witnessed the broadcast technology industry adapting to the limitations imposed by this worldwide pandemic? Yeah, I mean, it, the the ones who have been successful and I think probably a lot of people listening to this podcast have uh, watched quite a few uh, webinars. Uh, the ones who have been successful have really looked at a marketing plan on how to do such webinars, or even if it's le uh, learning, uh, got a good professional e-learning course uh, or e-learning platform. And the ones who have just taken their standard PowerPoint and put them uh, online uh, generally has been pretty poor. 
and uh, kind of doing webcasting is not for everybody and where people even they may be very comfortable standing in front of a stage presenting uh, their solutions or uh, talking about standards or whatever when it comes to a webcast it's a different type of medium where you need to keep the attention so uh, some have been really successful I've seen some brilliant absolutely brilliant uh, and I'll, I'll talk about for example Dal who had a magician in their web uh, the, their web session uh, just to keep the interest on, on their storage. So he was talking about how he's doing magic tricks and cutting in and out of magic tricks, for example. So, so there's been some great examples like that. Uh, whereas, as I say, the ones who just dryly do their uh, PowerPoint presentation that they've had off the shelf, usually it comes out pretty poorly. So, uh, you know, uh, so we, we've had to learn these skills and I'm sure the skills will get better. As, as we go ahead, but but it's worth really uh, uh, kind of, let's say, going to, a, let's call it a media consultant or a PR uh, group who can really help you through those presentations. So, yeah, following on from that, do you believe that virtual events will eventually replace in-person events and conferences in the future or, or simply complement them? Well, I, I think it's going to be a complementary. And, and there are some great advantages of, uh, you know, being online. Uh, I even had discussions with uh, uh, Broadcast Asia uh, organizers who are doing conference here in Singapore. And uh, the comment they made is that on the conference sessions, they managed to get a much higher level and quality speaker, first of all, because uh, they don't actually have to fly into Singapore just for the event. That's one advantage. Secondly, you can watch or listen uh, at your own will. So maybe some people are listening to this podcast while jogging along. Uh, if it's VOD, it's available 24-7, any time zone. Uh, where, so, so you can reach a different, and you can reach to an outside audience uh, from where the exhibition is located. So I think many of, uh, and Broadcast India, uh, Broadcast Asia, in, uh, IBC, Inter-B in Japan, uh, NAB are all, uh, you know, talking about, you know, expanding their virtual show. So even if they do the solid show, they will also have a virtual show. So it's going to work in complement. And, uh, you know, those people who can't make it for whether, whether it's cost reasons or time reasons, uh, they, you know, they, they can make it virtually. Yeah, I think it's been a really insightful past couple of months. And I definitely think there is a place for these physical and, and virtual shows to kind of coexist, uh, like you said. Um, yeah. So, I mean, what what are some of the innovations that brands within our industry should be utilizing to future proof their operations in future? Uh, you know, when you, obviously there's there's uh, platforms like uh, Zoom and uh, you can do conferencing on Teams. Um, Microsoft have, have other solutions. Uh, there are, which is one of the things I'm going to start uh, or I'm consulting with, is an e-learning group who can do remote training, remote, uh, let's say, distribution of information, we, you know, in a kind of uh, fun and easy way that you're, you're learning or you're taking it in. A lot of that marketing budget that maybe was going to the physical exhibition uh, will be going to maybe LinkedIn or YouTube or different videos, professional videos, which which will then uh, uh, get people to understand about the solutions or the products that you're providing. So have you got any kind of closing words to the broadcast media industry? Any words of advice? or? So certainly, I, I miss uh, seeing you guys <laughs> and, and being at the exhibition. Uh, one, one of the other things that I'm uh, working on, by the way, and I'll give a plug to... Uh, 4K for charity, uh, virtual race, which is physical race, which has gone uh, on online. Uh, so you can you can do it virtually. So I, I miss you guys, but at the end of the day, you know, there's still LinkedIn, there's still uh, Twitter or whatever, where where we can still interact. And uh, you know, I do look forward to meeting up in the, uh, at an exhibition or a conference or a bar maybe outside the exhibition. So certainly that's the side uh, uh, I miss and uh, what we'd love to get back. But I think it's going to be reduced and we're going to do more and more online. Uh, and I've done so many Zoom conferences 
uh, uh, and meetings, uh, and we just have to adapt to that. So, which is fine. We we just have to get into the new norm. Yeah, I was hoping to attend my first ever kind of trade show conference this year with Playbox and uh, obviously all this happened so <laughs> I'll have to look forward to next year potentially. Uh, sorry Neil I mean it, it's uh, IBC and maybe people listening I mean it's mind-blowing how big the exhibition is uh, you know it's amazing to see really every sector from end to end in, in one uh, one big building and same for NAB but uh, it will come back but it, it's going to take uh, two or three years to get back to the, really the the big show was uh, up until last year. Yeah, no, I really hope it does. I really do. Um, so, I mean, Peter, thanks so much for taking the time out to talk to us today. It's, it's been really appreciated. Um, is there anything exciting going on in the pipeline for you at the moment? Uh, yeah, well, I, as I said, I'm I'm representing uh, an e-learning platform and I'll be helping out Cobalt Digital uh, on their distribution in Asia. Uh, additionally, uh, working with CNT Magazine uh, uh, which is helping also do webinars and to to do get exposure for for companies uh, who want to get into Asia. So if you would uh, you do want to get a hold of me, probably best to look me up on LinkedIn and then uh, message me on on LinkedIn. Once again, thank you very much for coming on and talking to us today. Great. Okay. Thank you very much for the opportunity, Neil. It's great. Brilliant. Thanks, Peter. Okay. Cheers.